Very good evening. I welcome you all in this one day national webinar on biotechnology for human welfare organized by Department of Zoology in association with Internal Quality Assurance Cell, Charu Chandra College. I'm pleased to inform you all that we have got good number of participants not only from West Bengal, but also from different states in India and abroad. Now, I would like to introduce all the guests who are present at the moment in the studio with you all. Yes. We have our honorable teacher in charge, Professor Onuradha Ghosh, with us. We have our honorable coordinator, Internal Quality Assurance Cell, Dr. Shuparna Shen, with us. We have our honorable uh, speaker, Dr. Vaibhav Anil Dekshit from Bits Pelani, Rajasthan with us. We have our honorable speaker, Dr. Abhijit Mitra from Techno India University with us. And we have our honorable speaker, Dr. Shomindra Nath Talapatra from Sikkim Skills University with us. Now, I would like to request our honorable teacher in church and chief patron of our webinar, Professor Onuradha Ghosh to deliver welcome speech. Over to Professor Onuradha Ghosh. Good evening, everybody. Well, uh, firstly, uh, I, I say sorry because I have joined in a bit late due to some technical <laughs> reasons. Well, uh, anyhow, uh, my, I extend my welcome not only to the speakers today, Dr. Uh, Dikshit, Dr. Mitra, and Dr. Talapatro, 
but I welcome everybody who have joined this webinar on a very, very relevant topic that is biotechnology for human welfare. Since we are going through this pandemic, actually all the research, everything is based on this subject. Though I'm not a part, I, I'm not, I have not studied this subject or I do not know much about it, but I think that this is the basic uh, subject which, on which we sort of depend for all our new medicines, vaccines, and whatever. So we have really honorable speakers to enlighten us on this matter and to show us the way for new medicines, new vaccines, and how bi biotechnology can come into the welfare of human life. Well, I declare this webinar open and invite all of you to join in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Teacher in Church, uh, Professor Anuradha Kosh. Uh, now I would like to invite our Honorable IQSC Coordinator, Dr. Shuponna Shen, to say something regarding this webinar. Ma'am, now it's for you. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of IQSC Charu Chandra College, I welcome uh, the Honorable Speakers, Dr. Dikshit, uh, Dr. Vijit Mitra, and Dr. Shomendranath Talapatra. Uh, who will be speaking on biotechnology for human welfare. As uh, the teacher in charge, uh, Professor Ghosh has said, that this is a very, very relevant topic today. Uh, biotechnology, even though I am also um, quite ignorant on this topic, I do not know much, but still, I also feel that biotechnology plays a very important role in human life and human health. And today, considering uh, the situation through which we are going, we are all facing a pandemic and there are a lot of problems. Uh, basic research on this biotechnology will definitely help us in the future. Uh, students studying this biotechnology, they are easily absorbed and they get good jobs. And today, uh, they can also start up their own business, which is very important from the economic point of view, I feel. Uh, biotechnology plays a very important role in improving human health, and human health is of prime concern, as we now know. Uh, it also produces, that is what I have uh, read, it produces a number of important products like golden uh, rice, groundnut, soybeans, etc., and I think uh, students, instead of jobs, besides jobs, they can also start up their own business. They can be self-sufficient by starting up their own business, which will help us in future, not only for the economy, but also for the general welfare. So without wasting much more time, I would once again uh, welcome our esteemed speakers and request them to enlighten us on this very, very interesting and pertinent topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, all respected IQC coordinator, Dr. Shupan uh, Now I'd like to uh, invite uh, our respected head of the department, Department of Sulati Charuchandu College, Dr. Koushiki Chakraborty, to welcome our honorable speaker. Dr. Koushiki Chakraborty, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. The theme of our webinar is biotechnology for human welfare. As you all know, biotechnology is an application of biology and different other techniques to change or to modify products for specific human use. Biotechnology plays a very important role in human welfare and has revolutionized mankind since its existence. For example, in the field of medicine, biotechnology helps in providing effective treatments and prevention measures for different diseases by its inventions of novel drugs and recombinant vaccines. In the field of agriculture, biotechnology helps to produce biofertilizers and biopesticides, which are eco-friendly sources for agriculture. 
modern biotechnology is already making important contributions and poses significant challenges to aquaculture and fisheries development. In addition to this, application of different computational tools in biological sciences are gaining much attention in R&D laboratories nowadays. There are many more research and investigation processes are being carried out for improving the future technologies. So to uh, cover different uh, parameters of biotechnology for human welfare, our esteemed speakers, they have come from different places and will enlighten us about different parameters of biotechnology and bioinformatics. The first speaker of our first session is Dr. Bhaivab Anil Dekshit. I'd like to welcome Dr. Dekshit. Yeah, welcome Dr. Dekshit. Uh, it's my immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Vaivab Anil Dekshit, who completed PhD in medicinal chemistry at NIPER SAS Nagar Mohali under the supervision of Professor P. V. Varatam in 2012. He worked in Professor G. Mugesh's lab as a postdoc at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. In 2013, he moved for an industrial postdoc at AstraZeneca. Macclesfield, UK. After a couple of years of teaching experience at the School of Pharmacy and Technology Management, he moved in 2018 as assistant professor to the Department of Pharmacy, Birla Institute of Technology and Science, Pilani. His current research interests are application of quantum chemical and molecular dynamics methods in drug metabolism redox enzyme reaction mechanisms and drug toxicity predictions. He has received funding from European Molecular Biology Organization, that is EMBO, Royal Society of Chemistry, that is RSC UK, and computing grant from IIT Delhi. He will deliver talk on drug metabolism, tox toxicity, and implications for biotechnological applications. Over to Dr. Dikshit. Good evening to all. I hope you are able to hear me and uh, see my screen. Can I continue? Yeah, it's visible. universities where pharmacy institution started and over the years we have progressed uh, and recently got the institute of eminence status and according to the nirf ranking uh, our uh, we are doing very good and we are among the private institutes we are first in the pharmacy and our overall university ranking is, uh, is also very good and uh, our university is fostering and uh, promoting innovations and uh, there are many startups that have come up from the university in many couple of years. Uh, and we have international collaborations in, with many uh, international universities so that uh, you can see here. Uh, this is I'm sharing this for any aspiring students who might be interested. We also run practice school uh, for two semesters uh, during the coursework where students visit different farms pharma companies and technology companies and get training there while they are uh, still in their degree courses and they get stipend from these companies during this coursework. So, and this is our department of pharmacy where we have uh, a few faculties and PhD and we have first degree B form, M form and PhD programs are running. And these are in the department of pharmacy, our thrust areas are uh, drug design, pharmacology, toxicology, and uh, pharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics. 
and uh, some pharmaceutical biotechnology work is also carried out. But uh, today I will be talking mostly about drug metabolism and toxicity. Recently I was also invited to give a talk on in the drug discovery hackathon where uh, you might find this, uh, some of the students might find this talk useful for their work. So, but today I will be talking about drug toxicity and prediction. So, uh, to start with the basics of drug toxicity, we all take medicines for preventative or curative uh, measures. But as we know that drugs uh, are like double-edged swords, while they are treating your disease, they might also end up harming you and, um, and causing severe reactions. But the harm caused to the patient might be severe or it might be moderate, but sometimes it tends to become severe. And uh, moderate uh, side effects could be as simple as con constipation, some rash, rash or changes in the blood pressure or glucose level. But severe damages, some drugs might end up damaging the kidney, or liver or heart of the patients. And there are, so people are very much interested in understanding what are these mechanisms of uh, toxic, drug toxicity or drug induced toxicity. And uh, there are direct and indirect mechanisms about which I will talk in detail. So here uh, for comparison, the tissue of the liver for a normal uh, patient looks like this under the microscope. But if the patient has suffered any uh, liver cirrhosis, or damage due to the drug, the, the slide will look completely different. Similarly, uh, some drugs tend to induce abnormalities in the normal ECG and uh, often the patients who are more susceptible to this type of toxicity will experience arrhythmia. This is known as torsidis depointis. So these mechanisms of drug toxicity are classified like the following. Uh, on target toxicity, whenever the drug is activating its receptor or enzyme, it tends, sometimes it happens that the, uh, if the patient is, if the drug is not immediately metabolized from the system of the patient, the enzyme or the receptor might get, might get overactivated and you might see over, uh, overactivated response by the drug. So this call, uh, this type of toxicity, whenever it is seen, it is classified as on target toxicity. Your uh, target is getting activated, but not only activated, it is getting overactivated because of the extra engagement of the drug with the receptor. Another type of uh, toxicity is the immune hypersensitivity. Whenever any foreign agent comes inside our body, it is immediately recognized by the white blood T cells and uh, quite often allergic reactions are triggered. And as we are seeing in the current uh, scenario, majority of the COVID related deaths are uh, being linked to the immune hypersensitivity in the patients. Another type of toxicity is the off-target toxicity. The drugs that we synthesize for interaction with enzymes and proteins in the heart, because of their structural similarities to other molecules, they end up interacting elsewhere in the body once they are administered either orally or So whenever we see organ, fourth type is the uh, bioactivation. Whenever the drug enters in, into the body, most majority of the drugs tend to be non-polar, and uh, because they have to interact inside the uh, non-polar binding pockets of the proteins. Thus, how while we are optimizing their potency, we end up uh, increasing their size. We will try to degrade them. And and convert them into non uh, into more polar compounds so that they can dissolve in water and pass through urine. So this is mostly controlled by the drug metabolism, but drug metabolism not only act inactivates the drug, it may end up generating reactive metabolites that will end up damaging the tissues. So because of these all complicated four or five factors that I just talked about and four or five mechanisms because of which a drug may show toxicity. Predicting toxicity still remains a difficult task even for the major pharma uh, companies and with all the advances that we have seen in modern sciences. So because of all this rule-based and in vitro testing and even animal testing methodologies have been developed 
to early on predict the toxicity of the drugs and therefore concepts like therapeutic index have come into picture. But nevertheless, as I said, drug toxicity remains uh, one of the major causes of hospital de deaths. So there are some concepts and rules which people uh, regularly use in early drug discovery and even in cl clinical phases of where the patients are being administered drugs. So the clinicians and, and people, people who are taking care of them will evaluate uh, toxicity potential at different points. So the rules are of different uh, physical, chemical, pharmacological types. Uh, because I understand most of my audience is most likely to be uh, uh, MSc biotechnology and zoology students. So I'm not going into the details of the chemistry here. But uh, towards the end, you can freely ask me any queries that you may have. So uh, the rules are based on the pharmacokinetic, uh, physicochemical properties, especially the most popular one is known as the Lipinski rule of five, where drug which has molecular weight less than 500, log P less than five and number of hydrogen bond donor acceptors below set criteria, they are more likely to be orally absorbed and they have better chance of being a drug and less toxic therefore. Similar rules have been devised uh, in the discovery phases. Uh, interesting to note that PKA is one of the important parameters, but it is very rarely used in driving the lead optimization protocols. As in the physicochemical uh, parameters, there are uh, pharmacodynamic parameter based rules where uh, you will watch the potency of the drug molecules that uh, you are investigating. If it is an inhibitor, you will measure its IC50 or inhibition constant. If it is an antimicrobial drug, you would like to measure its minimum inhibitory concentration. If it is an agonist, you would see at what concentration it is uh, activating 50% of the receptors. That is known as EC50. And um, uh, at what concentration it is binding half of the receptors. So Ka is one such parameter. If it is a typical substrate for an enzyme, then you would classically measure its Michaelis maintained constant and uh, initial well, uh, maximal initial reaction velocity. So these are parameters based on which you would say that X drug is better than Y drug and therefore let us make that and try to test it in the animals and clinic. And one general rule is that large molecules tend to be more potent but they are not good drug candidates because their log P values tend to be much higher than 5. So other parameters like ligand efficiency have come over the years. Uh, I will not describe these in detail in the interest of time. And then there are pharmacokinetic parameters. Those fraction of drug absorbed, uh, C max, T max, with the T max is the time required for the drug to reach maximum plasma concentration. And there are various other parameters. These are, uh, and then in the clinic, efficacy is caused by ED50, that is the effective dose, which gives 50% uh, of the patient are getting benefit at that dose, are routinely used the criteria. And to assess the toxicity of a compound which is being tested in clinical phases, again, ED50 therapeutic index are logically or any other logically predetermined criteria are routinely being used. So these two physicochemical and pharmacodynamic parameters are generally uh, useful in the hit identification that means very early phases of drug discovery whereas the pharmacokinetic based parameters are more valuable during the clinical phases of the drug development. And here we often want to monitor efficacy and toxicity using these same parameters or some variations. In addition to that, in the clinical phases, people will do biochemical tests to understand the functions, whether the vital organs are functioning properly or not. In the clinical phases, the main focus remains on toxicity and obviously efficacy. And therefore, classical therapeutic index like concepts are used, used which are the ratio of the LD50 to EC50. ND50 is the dose which causes uh, death in 50% of the patient and ED50 is the dose which gives a therapeutic benefit to at least 50% of the patient. But these classical therapeutic index criteria are uh, 
very rarely used in clinic these days because you can't uh, have a clinical trial in which you want to see at what those half of the patients would die. So this classical method of testing therapeutic index is mostly restricted to preclinical testing where animal testing is done. But because nowadays, because of animal ethic awareness, even this criteria is not uh, used in animals. Therefore, alternative exposure centric therapeutic index are being used which are the ratio of the IC50 to the Cmax and again uh, in the interest of time I am not going into the details of these parameters but you could easily uh, understand the details given these references and the textbook like Goodman Gilman but strangely enough there is still no consensus on how to use different therapeutic index in different phases and more or that's how people use a translational therapeutic index like uh, concept uh, but most of the time, the parameters that you will estimate in the very early phases of drug discovery are no longer used by the time you reach the clinic. So it's like a mismatch. You have a valuable information available in these two phases, which are not being uh, or very limitedly being used in the late phases. This was the motivation that uh, we wanted to integrate these uh, rules into one value that uh, led us to the discovery of drug toxicity index which we said that let us club all the information that is available into the physicochemical pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic parameters into one parameter which we are calling drug toxicity index this concept uh, conceptually it's the drug toxicity index says that the toxicity of any drug is likely to be high if it has very extreme potencies that means it is highly potent or not potent at all. In both these conditions, the, it is likely that the drug will be toxic. And uh, it is also likely to be highly toxic if it has high off-target potency. That means at low concentration, it is not only hitting the target that you want, but it is also hitting other enzymes and proteins. And that's a situation which you don't want. And if that happens, the drug is more likely to be highly toxic. And on the physicochemical parameter side, you don't want the drug to be highly polar because you want it to cross the cell membranes at different uh, locations in the body otherwise it won't be able to reach the target but you don't want it to be too non-polar otherwise it will get heavily metabolized in the liver and you know, liver damage may ensure uh, may start so you want the right balance between polarity and non-polarity in the drug like compounds and therefore you don't when you administer the drug you want to also control the C max value, it should not be too high and too low. So, and all these potential because of these parameters will ultimately be altered by the dose that you administered and uh, uh, what amount of that dose is absorbed, especially for the oral drugs. So, with this understanding, we came up with a formula which this study is now published. You can read it from this paper. But to define drug toxicity index is the logarithmic sum of the scaled pharmacodynamic, kinetic, and physical toxicity contributions. These toxicity contributions are defined by these equations, which are discussed in detail in the paper. That's why I'm not going into the detail here. But you are welcome to ask me any question towards the end or afterwards also. So this drug toxicity index was calculated for 711 drugs and data was collected for them from different sources available which are detailed in the methodology and we found that uh, we set a criteria that the DTI value as calculated with this formula should come out to be less than 1 and we tested that for how many existing drugs it is known to be less than 1 and we found that there is a good correlation especially for the cardiovascular drugs the genitourinary class of drugs and the central nervous system acting drugs and even the musculoskeletal drugs for these categories which I have highlighted here the DTI parameter works uh, especially well compared to the exposure centric therapeutic index and all other kind of parameters that are discussed in details uh, in the paper and we also found that DTI liver toxicity is one of the major concerns uh, during drug development and therefore, USFDA has prepared a data set known as the liver toxicity knowledge base and which they have given some annotations and, uh, and labeling to the drugs. Again, uh, the details in the interest of time, I'm not going in there. Uh, but we applied our method uh, and uh, 
saw that for how many drugs we are able to predict the liver toxicity as reported in the US FDA database. And again, because of the high number of data that is available for the CNS cardiovascular class of drugs, we found that the accuracy in this category is more, uh, but it is quite reasonable in some other cases also. And as the data increases, the accuracy of the model would increase. So we have proposed a workflow of how one could use this DTI method in one's own drug discovery program that you will estimate the drug toxicity index contributions at different levels when the molecule is only in silico you have not synthesized it then also you can predict the physicochemical parameters and its toxicity contribution when you have synthesized the selected compounds and tested their IC50 value that time you can make a prediction and see whether the DTI value is already uh, predicted to be above 1 or not and for those compounds where the value is still predicted to be less than 1 you can go ahead and test them in animals and we have in, uh, in with the help of some of our students we have uh, made a DTI portal on which you can go and log into your predicted IC50 C max values and it will give you an estimate of the DTI value which uses the equation that I showed earlier. So based on that you could select or reject molecules that you want to take forward in your drug discovery programs. But nevertheless there are all models are models they are never 100% accurate so there are some current limitations which you should not ignore while using this method or any other method for that matter. And so uh, they are apparently here so I will not describe them. Uh, but uh, as of today, the model is applicable only for orally administered drugs and in cases where the mechanism of action is properly known. So with this, we, uh, I come to the next phase of the presentation, which is on drug metabolism and uh, discovery and how it can, the findings in drug metabolism area have been used by many people in biotechnological applications and we are just about to enter in that area in our department. So as I said already that drug discovery and development is a very difficult task. Uh, most of the time 50% of the drugs will fail during clinical trial uh, and most of the drugs that fail out of those 50% failures are due to drug metabolism issues and out of those 25% fail in the phase 2 clinical trials and for them metabolism is the primary reason for withdrawal of the drug from the clinical trials and this is causing a lot of uh, loss of funds time and life of patients uh, there are few cases which i am showing on the screen uh, these drugs were recently failed in the clinical trial because of the metabolism issues so metabolism area is not yet solved there is a lot of understanding in the scientific community some of which you will find in the textbook and recent review articles but the problem is as of yet not 100% solved and that is evident by these examples that even today many drugs are failing in the clinical phases because of metabolism related issues which are uh, which the current models are unable to predict so that's why also we are interested in this area of prediction of drug uh, phase 1 and phase 2 this is a classical textbook picture where different enzymes in phase 1 and phase 2 metabolism are highlighted. And uh, so one important concept uh, that often comes again and again in drug metabolism is the site of metabolism, which is defined as an atom or a group of atoms where metabolic reactions are taking place. So the detailed chemistry part, part I am skipping, but you can easily read it from the Goodman Gilman or uh, Fohe textbook. So I would like to briefly describe the what happens to a drug when it enters into a human body. Firstly, most of the drugs are non-polar, so they interact with their desired targets that gives you the therapeutic benefit. But uh, quite often they do interact with the off targets that gives you all kinds of side effects. But because the drug is non-polar, it also undergoes metabolism. Phase 1 and phase 2, there are a lot of enzymes involved in this. Most of the time the metabolism should lead to no polar metabolites that are excreted, so you are fine. But every now and then the metabolism leads to reactive metabolites which cause all kinds of toxicity. And only uh, for only cytochromes and FMOs and nowadays UGT there is good understanding of how to predict. But for a large number of enzymes 
that are also listed in the earlier slide, uh, good uh, quality models are not yet available. So we are actively working in this area to develop good drug metabolism prediction models, mostly using uh, molecular modeling and drug design principles. So here, uh, cytochrome P450 and the catalytic cycle that it uh, uh, reactions that it catalyzes is highly important. In the interest of time, I am not going into the details, but the catalytic cycle is shown here and highlighted in the red, uh, red or the color. The rate determining step is highly important, which involves the uh, reduction of this, uh, this cytochrome heme by one electron and uh, and then the catalytic cycle initiates, then oxygen binds and another electron comes in, and then two protons will bind to the and give you the active oxidizing species which will metabolize the drug. But the rate controlling step is this where the first electron transfer takes place. So recently we have used uh, quantum chemical methods in which I am skipping to go into the details and use the Marcus theory of electron transfer reactions to predict uh, what are the factors that control the first uh, step in the cytochrome people 50 reactions. And quite interestingly, we are able to use the Marcus model to predict that monovalent cations will lead to cytochrome p 50 activation and divalent cations will inhibit them and our model is also able to explain the behavior of uh, classical type 2 inhibitors uh, yeah, where textbook and uh, other uh, literature will tell you what are these. So coming to the last part of my presentation, I'm sorry I'm going very fast but I hope that's okay. So uh, in terms of applications of P450 reactions in the biotech industry, you might be surprised to know that 2018 Nobel Prize was awarded to Francis Arnold for their discoveries uh, in this area, which this figure will describe uh, in a minute. But these uh, drugs are getting metabolized. So the pharma industry and academia as such are all the time interested in studying the metabolites in detail, how they are uh, generated, how they are distributed among different organs. And therefore, in clinical trials, uh, authentic samples of the drug metabolites are always in high demand and these P450 people have used to clinically synthesize these uh, clinically relevant uh, drug metabolites can be synthesized in the lab using P450 reactions for this people will engineer the P450 enzymes to form large amounts of these metabolites for which uh, quite often you need to generate mutants and that will create a novel reaction capabilities of industrial importance. For example, 1A2 is the isoform of P450, which is routinely used to generate metabolites of propanolol and warfarin. This is an anti-hypertensive drug and this is used in the blood clotting um, conditions. Another example in the 2C9 family are the metabolites of diclofenac, warfarin and ibuprofen are used to uh, uh, help uh, industry perform the clinical trials according to the standards that FDA is expecting from them. But nevertheless, cytochrome P450s are also involved in the degradation of the pesticides and other kind of harmful chemicals that might end up entering you through the food. And they and also these DDT and other pesticides are degrading the environment, causing a lot of pollution. So people have investigated the applications of P450 in degrading the uh, environmental toxicants and pollutants. And recently, Arnold, as I mentioned, have developed another form of the enzyme. Uh, this is popularly known as CYP411, uh, which instead of the sulfur has a, has a serine at the actual position. And this is able to catalyze the organic reactions, which don't happen in nature, but they, they are only possible to do in flask with the help of some other transition metal catalyst. But they have been able to develop a new enzyme where in the place of uh, actual sulfur, they have placed it with serine residue and then they are able to form carbon-carbon bonds uh, using uh, novel P450s or P411s. So with these uh, applications, I would like to thank uh, you and all the my teachers and uh, mentors who have supported me in all these years. And thank you. I'm open to any questions that you may have.
thank you dr dikshit for your uh, nice explanation and presentation uh, i have a question just very basic question and i'll not ask you any question related to chemistry uh, okay uh, is it possible to develop any drug without any side effects that is a magic bullet and magic bullet are only available in stories so unfortunately not okay uh, one question is waiting for you hello how can we can predict have... toxicity of any drug through software shundipon chatterjee is asking how can we predict toxicity of any drug through software yes you can use my methodology that is drug toxicity index but there are other methods available like swiss adme and uh, there are other uh, uh, qsar methods that is quantitative structure activity relationships most of the time this is the approach pharma industry takes that they have uh, more than 15 20 compounds in their laboratories they have tested them in animals and they know what is the structural feature that is leading to one kind of toxicity so they will use uh, mathematical and uh, computational models methods to develop uh, qsar models for predicting toxicity nowadays even when large amount of data is available people are using machine learning methods to predict uh, toxicity and uh, therefore these uh, softwares are available but none of the software should be used like a black box they are assumptions one should always keep in mind that the models are only as good as the input data so models are not most of the time people tend to think that uh, if i have a software so software cannot make mistakes no softwares do make mistakes because they are bound by the input uh, quality of the input data that was given while generating the model so you should while using any software you should uh, check what is its applicability domain applicability domain and uh, uh, am i making the correct use of this software that one should always keep in mind and uh, so people who develop these softwares they will openly quite openly tell you what are their limitations what can be done what cannot be done i hope that helps uh, okay another question is waiting for you what is the average duration for human trials before any drug is released this is a common question that appears uh, uh, so this uh, this average uh, answer uh, would depend on the area that you are working in And if you are developing a antidepressant compound or an antihypertensive drug, or you are working in the uh, viral infection like nowadays, so if there was no um, uh, COVID pandemic around, and you are developing a drug for virus uh, treatment of a viral infection, then the drug discovery protocol will be longer. It may take anywhere between five to uh, seven to ten years. but when the we are uh, in such crisis situation the government also knows that the regulatory agency also knows that so they will relax uh, some criteria which will not compromise the quality of the product which will not allow you to compromise the quality of the efficacy of the drug that the patient should get benefit and the patient should not get unnecessary harm that is the main uh, purpose of drug discovery and any clinical trial i hope that uh, helps uh, answer that question okay i think uh, there is no more question okay another question is coming yeah sangeeta agarwal is asking do you suggest the vaccines can also have some toxicity especially the covid-19 in the absence of long term toxicity study data what are the possible toxic effects uh, i i must admit that i am not an expert in the vaccine area but uh, a general rule is that uh, no drug is without toxicity that is uh, uh, given and there is no question about that so if somebody is telling you that my drug is magic bullet most of the time either they are ignorant or they are lying and uh, 
so so yes vaccines will have some kind of toxicity and this is a very hot topic being discussed uh, if you want genuine information you should uh, i will insist all the viewers to go on the us fda website and the who websites there you will find authentic information another question how do the antibiotics will harm you by because they will get metabolized in the body uh, and they will uh, often get converted into reactive metabolites which will bind to your protein and dna and it will affect their no normal functioning of the dna and proteins and therefore the cell will get apoptotic signals the cell will get signal that there is damage which is beyond repair so let us kill the cell i have a question how can we use nanobiotechnology to deliver drugs in human body and what will be the side effects am i allowed to pass the question this is not my area of okay, expertise okay okay because i don't want to give them a wrong understanding yeah okay thank you dr dikshit for your uh, nice presentation and question answer session yeah thank you for uh, inviting me and having me in this webinar thank you, thank you. bye thank you bye now uh, we will start our session 2 i'd like to invite mrs pallavi dat to conduct session 2 over to pallavi good evening everybody I am Professor Pallavi Dutto, Department of Zoology, faculty member. I am uh, extremely privileged and honored. We are extremely privileged and honored to call upon our next speaker in the technical session two, Dr. Ubijit Mitra. And I would like to read, please. Yes, welcome, sir. And uh, it's just a bio, uh, brief bio of Dr. Ubijit Mitra. I would like to read, Dr. Ubijit Mitra. associate professor and former head department of marine science university of calcutta has been active in the sphere of oceanography since 1985 he obtained his phd as net qualified scholar in 1994 after securing gold medal in msc in marine science from university of calcutta since then he joined calcutta port trust and wwf in various capacities to carry out research programs on environmental science biodiversity conservation climate change and carbon sequestration presently dr mitro is serving techno india university west bengal as the director of research he has to his credit about 530 scientific publications in various national and international journals and 38 books of post graduate standards dr mitro is presently the member of several committees like pacon international IUCN SIOS etc and has successfully completed about 19 projects on biodiversity loss in fishery sector coastal pollution alternative livelihood climate change and carbon sequestration Dr Mitra also visited as faculty member and invited speakers in several foreign universities of Singapore Kenya Oman and USA in 2008 Dr Mitra was invited as visiting fellow at University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth USA to deliver a series of lecture on climate change. Dr Mitra also successfully guided 36 PhD students. Presently his domain of expertise includes environmental science, mangrove ecology, sustainable aquaculture, alternative livelihood, climate change and carbon sequestration. so without much delay i am inviting sir to start the lecture on our topic biotechnology for human welfare over to sir okay uh thank you i think i am audible yes uh is it audible yes sir it is audible okay uh, uh let me first start with uh, giving uh, thanks to the organizer who have uh, 
uh, thought it uh, that I should be there in this platform, in this knowledge exchange program. And also, I would like to extend my thanks to the, all the participants present over here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, scholars, and young students. So uh, before starting, I would like to tell that whenever we speak of biotechnology, something comes in our mind that we must be speaking something about molecular biology, about genetic engineering, or something like that. But biotechnology, so far, I feel, my personal opinion is that it is a sort of technology which is applied to life science. For example, uh, for example, I want to show you, this is a glass of water. You know, this is a glass of water. And in class eight, we know that this water is colorless, the water is odorless, the water is tasteless. This is the simple chemistry which I like to tell to all the students. But if we replace this water with another water, say, for example, collected from the stream just behind your house or in your locality, you will see that it is greenish in color, slightly greenish in color, turbid. The white is that. Somebody has put green color in that. I think it is a knowledge of class 10 that inside the water there are phytoplankton. And this phytoplankton has got the pigments inside it, chlorophyll A, B, C. And these pigments impart green color to the water bodies because of the phytoplankton bloom, because of the phytoplankton population replication, and because of the phytoplankton enhancement in the aquatic system. And to know that what, how much phytoplankton is there in this water, what you have to do, you have to use the spectrophotometer after an extraction with a solvent, with an organic solvent. So you are applying technology to know the amount of phytoplankton, the amount of phytopigment present in the water, and this is biotechnology. And also there is another technology to know that how much phytopigment is present in the water, and that is through remote sensing. A satellite-based sensor is there, which scan the water bodies, and it tells that, well, this is the East Kolkata wetland, this is the another pond, this is the ocean, this is the Bay of Bengal, this is the Sundarbans. So with the radiation coming from the phytopigment, it is trapped by the sensor and then it is given to you in the form of satellite image. That is also biotechnology. So any type of technology when applied to life science, that is the biotechnology. And today I'll be telling you the application of biotechnology in the, in the, in the brackish water sector. Brackish water means not the seawater, which is having a salinity of 35 or 34 parts per thousand. What is that? That means 35 milligram, 35 gram of salt, if dissolved in one liter of water, that is called 35 PSU. This is the unit of seawater salinity. If it is 10 PSU, that means 10 gram of salt is dissolved in one liter of water. So just like the percentage, the unit of salinity is parts per thousand. You must remember that. Now, whenever we talk about the aquaculture, we must not only concentrate only on the prawn culture. In aquaculture sector, even if you, if you cultivate the seaweed, that is also aquaculture. If you cultivate this one, I, I think you, you, have, you, you know this one. This is an olive ridley turtle. This is an olive ridley turtle. And, 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 and if you culture this, you, you can get at different types, we have we are doing it for different types of toxicity studies with the permission of the MOEF. And these are all the uh, events which comes under the biotechnology. So aquaculture means not only the culturing of the fish species, but also the culturing of the seaweeds, the culturing of the molas, the culturing of the oysters, the culturing of the uh, turtles, even, even the dolphins you are training that is also coming under the biotechnology. Oh, so without wasting much, much time, let me uh, uh, go to the main uh, parts uh, that uh, uh, which I'm going to share. Uh,
So this is the title, the application of biotechnology in aquaculture. It's a new dimension. What, what, why I will tell it a new dimension? Because we have formulated some special type of fish feed for, with a very low cost that has boosted the production, that has enhanced the growth, and that has prevented the fish from the diseases. And thereby, and thereby the loss in the aquacultural sector has been diminished to a great extent. So first I will start, uh, perhaps uh, I would congratulate uh, all the speakers, uh, Dr. Dixit, Dr. Talapatro. Uh, Dr. Talapatro is just like my uh, younger brother and is known to me for a long time. And uh, this is me. Uh, today I'll be delivering talks, but much, most of the talks I'll be giving on the Sundarbans because, you know, the concept of the biotechnology itself is taken from the nature. If you go to Sundarbans, you will see the various types of mangrove trees. They are having pneumatophores, they are having prop roots, they are having steel roots, and they are the ones who are protecting us from the disaster like Ampan, like Isla, like Fani, like Bulbul, etc. They, they are just like the line of defense in our Calcutta hinterland. So if you go to Sundarbans, you will see, and if you collect the data in the internet, you will see that there are about 232 species of commercially important fishes. Why? Why so much huge number? Why it is the basket of the fish? The thing is that the mangroves of Sundarbans, they decompose and form nitrate phosphate amino acids, which get dissolved in the waters. So amino acids is free amino acids is available in the Sundarban water. And this is where the nature's teaching on the biotechnology starts. The free amino acids, lysine, glycine, uh, analine, all these are available in free state in the Sundarban estuarine water. If you see Sundarban estuarine water, you will see there are seven estuaries. This is the Hooghly estuary. You see this blue color. It is coming from the Gangotri glacier of the Himalaya. So, and this is this region is the Bay of Bengal. All all these are carrying the fresh water. But you see, this estuary is Matla, three, four, five, six, seven. These are the different estuaries which do not have any fresh water connection. Therefore, there is no fresh water over here. And this region are hypersaline. So the Sundarban water from three to seven, Bay of Bengal area is hypersaline. The salinity is very high, about 30 PSU. That means 30 gram of salt in one liter of water. But if you come to this section one and two, the salinity is about 10 PSU. That is 10 gram of salt in one liter of water. Why it is 10 PSU? Because it is getting the fresh water from here. So this is the just uh, I'm telling you about the geographical area to make your baseline clear. Now, this is Sundarbans and these are the mangroves and these mangroves grow uh, go under the water twice daily during the high tide and you see these uh, how the tides are coming from the bay of bengal and this is the cyclonic depressions when it reaches these mangroves prevents the cyclonic depressions and becomes and its speeds becomes minimized when it reaches the city of kolkata now this is the teaching from the nature these are the mangrove trees. About 34 varieties of mangrove trees are present in Sundarbans. And uh, these mangrove trees, when the leaves become aged, when they die due to different diseases, they get decomposed. And these decomposed leaves, because of the microbial degradation, forms nitrate, phosphate, and amino acids, which get dissolved in this water. And these nitrate, phosphate form the body of the phytoplankton. If you analyze the formula of the phytoplankton, it has got the empirical formula CH206, NH316, H3PO4. That means the body of the phytoplankton is made up of nitrogen, phosphorus, and silicon. So when the phytoplankton is there, then obviously the food chain will be developed. There will be zooplankton, there will be the fishes. This is the reason why the Sundarban area is so productive. Now, if you really look into the Sundarban water in the deep forest where there is no pollution, you will see that the water is totally green in color. Why? Because I have already told you because of the presence of the phytoplankton, which has got the pigment like chlorophyll AB, which is imparting green color to the water. And 
because of that, they are sustaining the fish community in Sundarbans. Now, this is another important part. This is the only area in the whole planet we are really proud, the Indians would be really proud, because this is the place where we are getting the Royal Bengal Tiger, Panthera Tigris Tigris. These mangroves on the composition they produce, the detritus, the mulch, the organic carbon. This organic carbon is consumed by the crabs, and the crabs are taken in the food chain by the tiger. So this is another food chain. This food chain is known as the detritus food chain. The other food chain, which I told you, that was the that was this was the uh, pelagic food chain. That means the phytoplanktons are formed and they are consumed by the fish. And this is the detritus food chain. That means the organic carbon are formed and this organic carbon are consumed by the crabs and then they are consumed and they are taken as the food by the tiger. So in the Sundarban, aquaculture is an age-old practice, but it is not very sustainable. Why? Because in order to go, go for the aquaculture, you need to go for the hatchery to grow seed. But Sundarban water is having a salinity between 10 to 20 PSU. That means 10 to 20 gram of salt in one liter of water. And for developing a hatchery, you need to uh, form a salt content of 30 to 35 PSU, that is 30 to 32 gram of salt in one liter of water, which is not possible in Sundarban. It is possible in Andhra Pradesh. It is possible in Odisha. So in, in Sundarban, there is no hatchery. And that's, that is why aquaculture is not very sustainable in Sundarban. Moreover, if you go to Sundarban, you will see, if, if, in, if you go, anybody goes to Digha, you will see lots of fishing vessels and trawlers. And you see, they are always painted to prevent the deterioration of the wood quality. And they are painted with the black tar, which contains zinc, copper, lead, cadmium, like toxic substances. They come inside the water body, they go inside the fish, and therefore, the, due to bio magnification, these heavy metals come inside the body of the human beings. And that's why many of the aquacultural productions from Sundarbans is often rejected by the foreign country on the ground of the quality control. So, aquaculture is not very, very sustainable in Sundarbans, and we have to be very, very cautious. What we can do is, and there is another trade in Sundarbans, that's like the city of the Kolkata. Since we are de destroying the mangroves, there is not much mangroves to absorb the carbon dioxide. So what is happening? The carbon dioxide level is going up and up. You know, the world carbon dioxide level now is 409.18 ppm. This is, this is the latest data of NASA. Now, if you see today's only, I think it is somewhere about 417 uh, ppm or like that. So yesterday I saw in the NASA site, it's like that. Now in Sundarban also, it is very similar. The carbon dioxide is rising in every season, whether it is pre-monsoon, whether it is monsoon, whether it is post-monsoon, and it has crossed the level of 400 ppm. The permissible level is 350 ppm. And it has now crossed 400 ppm. So this is also a major threat to aquaculture. Because more the carbon dioxide is there, there will be a blanket effect. You know that carbon dioxide is a heavy gas. And therefore, it settles down. It forms a blanket around the Earth. And therefore, of this blanket, the solar radiation after reflection cannot go back to the space. And it gets trapped. And the temperature rises. When the temperature rises, you know very well that the enzyme function does not work properly because there is a uh, optimum value of temperature for uh, for a proper functioning of the enzyme system and therefore there is some metabolic disorder seen in the fishes of sundarbans during the time of summer during the pre-monsoon when the temperature touches about 40 degrees centigrade the atmospheric air temperature i'm telling so now what I'm telling is that when the carbon dioxide is increasing, the temperature is also increasing at the same time. This is a correlation graph where I'm showing that the carbon dioxide and the temperature is increasing, uh, increasing simultaneously. And more is the carbon dioxide, more is the temperature, which is uh, also posing an adverse second, uh, effect on the aquacultural sector. So now it is a million dollar question that whether 
there is an effect of the change in the salinity because in Sundarban, the sea level is rising at the rate of 3.14 millimeter per year. Is there any adverse effect? The answer is yes. The answer is yes, as seen from the Sanon Wiener Species Diversity Index. If you see the Sundarbans, uh, commercially important fish, if you see this graph from 1984 to 2014, you see the commercially important fish is decreasing. The blue color in the done in the software MATLAB, you see this is the, uh, this is the uh, scale for the decrease. The blue color means the decrease. You see from 1984 to 2014, the commercially important fish is decreasing. Whereas the trash fish here is increasing. You see from 1984 to 2014, in 2014, it's a brownish color. Brownish color means almost stop. The trash fish, that means Harpodon nehidius, then other fish, uh, all the trash fishes like the cyanoglossus, all these are increasing in Sundarbans because the salinity is posing an adverse impact on Lisa Persia, on Lisa Tade, on Teniolosha Elisha, that means the palatable Indian shad Hilsha, but it is promoting the reproduction it is proliferating the growth of it is accelerating the growth of trash fishes so sundarban is having so sundarban is having a very a very very adverse situation in terms of the fishes now is there any other effect for the student community i will tell that it is it is also a very simple test if you want to know the growth of the fish the condition of the fish you have there is an index which is known as the condition index what is condition index just divide the weight of the fish with the cube of the lead just take a fish take its weight in a pan balance and take its length say the weight is 100 gram and its length is 10 so 100 by 10 cube that means 100 by 1000 will give you the condition index more the value of the condition index means better is the condition so it is seen that for every type of fish the western indian sundarban is having a better condition index compared to the central sector why because i have already told you the western indian sundarban is hyposaline because it is getting the fresh water from the hugli river and that's why there is a brackish water environment in the western sector but the central sector is hypersaline that is why the commercially important fish is not having a better condition in the central sector now i'm not going into details because it will time consuming but the moral of the story is the central sector has a congenial congenial that means a very good environment not for the commercial fish but for the trash fish and this trash fish is used for the preparation of fish feed why most of the fish feed in aquaculture is made up of even the aquarium fish you are purchasing the globules like fish feed most of the fish feed are made from the trash variety of fish which are not commercially important they are very low price for example 10 rupees per kg 20 rupees per kg and they are grinded and they are made into small pellets small volumes to give the aquarium fish this is an industry where from that entrepreneurship can be developed by the young stars in my last lecture i I have brought some of the students of the BCOM who have developed a very good fish feed industry and aquarium industry, and they are earning a lot. Even they are exporting it to Thailand and, and, and other South Asian countries to, uh, to get their pocket money. So there are provisions. So if you purchase this trash fish and make them the fish feed for the ornamental fish of the aquarium or any other aquaculture species, that is a very good thing. But there is also a bad thing also. What is the bad thing? Bring these trash fishes when they are not consumed by the culture species, they remain in the pond bottom or in the aquarium. Then what happens? These feed are rich in protein. They start decomposing from the ammonia. And ammonia is toxic. It dissolves in water, forms ammonium hydroxide, and it causes the death of the fish. So these Chemistry, these basic things should be understood while making the fish feed. So, whatever we have started, we are trying to replace this animal protein with the plant protein. And that is also very cheap. What we have done, 
we have uh, see this is also oyster this is i want to tell you that this also comes under aquaculture you know oyster if you go to digha if you go to shankarpur if you go to puri if you go to goa if you go to any any maritime states you will see that oysters are there on any hard structure substratum like the swiss gate like the like the, like the barnacles uh, settling you will see oysters on the side of the ship on the boat these oysters are not what consumes the western water because people do not have that idea but if you go to five star hotel like that people like kayak like hotel they have the oyster dish this flesh within the oyster they are rich in protein about 20 to 21 percent protein is there in the flesh and low cholesterol they are consumed in south asian countries also in the goa and in usa france japan oyster is a special dish and it comes under the bible Albia, because you see one of the valve I am telling, uh, telling you this is calcaria. Well, this is also is under threat, which I will come because because of the acidification of the water, more the carbon dioxide is on the in the, in the atmosphere, it dissolves in the water, forms a carbonic acid, and this carbonic acid is gradually dissolving this calcaria shell because you know the calcium carbonate dissolves in presence of the low pH uh, low pH acid, and therefore this oysters community is also under threat. This uh, just an uh, offshoot I am telling that. Uh, these oyster culture also comes under the aquaculture. Anyway, I am coming at the local level. What can be done? You can start PC culture in small water bodies. If even in the in the house, if you have a tank of uh, of say three meter into five meter with a depth of one meter or two meter, you can develop uh, a very good. Fishing uh, uh, type of entrepreneurship, a startup with with that, and also you can prepare your own food. How you can prepare your own food? You, you see, we have started the trip like this. We have grown the wheat grass. What are wheat grass? Just in Bengali, we call it gom. Get the wheat from the market, and then put some water. Put it with a wet sack and put it for fourteen days and then it will start growing these are some of the experiment we have done day zero we have put that that wheat over there then day six it have start growing then day seven it have grown and then you take this for example 50 milligram and put it 300 milliliter of water and then put it in the mix you get the wheat juice wheat juice is very rich in vitamin it is also consumed by human beings in France, in USA, as a health, as a health drink, and this wheat, whatever you are getting, this wheat juice can be used. Even the wheat grass can be used for the preparation of the fish feed. See, these are the uh, experiments we have done, and these are the blended particles, a blended uh, of wheat grass over here. We have developed, we have grinded it, we have dried it, and we have converted it into fish feed. And uh, and and uh, this we are just blending and put it in the mixy to get the wheat grass juice. So this is the uh, this is the procedure. In the details, uh, we have to add take 50 gram of the wheat grass. In it, you have to add 300 milliliter of the water, mix it, and then put it in the blender or in the mixy to get the wheat juice. And whatever is remaining in the form uh, after the leftover that you can use as a in the fish feed so wheat why in the fish feed it is containing protein it is containing all the amino acids 20 amino acids in the wheat and that's why if you replace the trash fish with the wheat grass you are getting a very good growth and we have done this experiment and uh, and and but there is there, there is some also cautions because whenever you are growing this you are also there is you must be careful because there are a lot of aerobic bacteria there are a lot of fungus which can which can uh, uh, mix with the wheat grass and whenever you are making food that will uh, will also go inside the fish and that may cause the disease of the fish so you can you have to put it under the uv radiation scanner to destroy uh, the dna of these microbes and uh, these are some of the uv sterilizer where with a low wavelength uh, you can you can just with the electromagnetic radiation you can destroy the dna and uh, and, and, and the other uh, parts of the microbes so that the cell gets 
degraded and uh, and your wheat grass becomes free of the microbes and that becomes a very good uh, and a quality food for this and and therefore these bacteria these mites this uh, fungus all this should be uh, the wheat grass should be passed through the uv radiation to get a purified form and now you get the feed and this is a protein requirement for the fresh water uh, uh, just who introduced uh, Paul Levy Dato, she is doing an experiment in the in an artificial form pond in the roof of Techno India University, where she has developed some fish feed. And you know the protein in, in the case of the larvae is 45 to 50. It's just like the human baby. When the baby is born, you give uh, a nutritious feed. But when the ages come, can the old uh, old grandma or the old grandfather in your home can digest? Uh, 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 mutton or high level protein. So as the age increases, the protein level also decreases. But in the larval stage, the protein requirement is about 50, uh, 45 to 50 percent. But you see, after the larvae comes the fry, then the fingerlings, then the juveniles, then the adults. With the passage of the time, as the age increases, you see from the 45 to 50 percent, it has come to 28 to 30 percent. I'm not talking about the brooder. Brooder are the pregnant uh, fishes, uh, so they require more proteins. But if you culture this, you will uh, the more it is it is going uh, for the, with the with the passage of time. The more the age is increasing, the protein level has to decrease uh, in the fish. You have to make the fish with lay uh, with less percentage of the protein. So these are the other components like the lipid, fatty acids, carbohydrate, uh, fiber, and and then. What, what I'm telling is that what, what I'm telling is that about the fish meal, if, you see, previously we used to have 25 percent of 25 percent fish meal, and now we have replaced this fish meal with a wheat grass, 10 percent wheat grass, and we got a good growth. We, do, we have made one control, one the experimental. With the, in the control, we have used the uh, feed uh, purchased from the market. You see the histological section. The muscle fiber has not expanded, but here you see the muscle fiber. MF is the muscle fiber. It has expanded and it has given a good growth. And as a result, it has also given a good condition factor. I have told that the condition factor is the ratio of the weight and the cube of the length. That is weight divided by length cube. And if the weight increases, why the weight will increase? Because due to expansion of this muscle. And if the weight increases, the numerator increases, then the condition factor will also increase. And therefore, by applying the wheat grass uh, in the fish feed, replacing the trash feed, we have not only controlled the water pollution, excess ammonia and ammonium hydroxide and organic load, but also we have enhanced the growth of the fish. So now, this is a new dimension in the aquacultural sector. You know, the essential amino acids, 20 amino acids are there. And now the aquaculture has gone to such a level that the amino acid sequence of the fish is considered with protein analyzer, analyzer with amino acid sequencer. And then it is matched with the amino acid profile of the feed. And if the match is, is greater than 80 percent then that fish is the best fish. this type of research has started in various companies and there are scope of employment in those companies for example the, uh, this is an automatic protein sequencer which will uh, tell you about the amino acid sequence and this type of research has already started in the cp this is uh, very important with head office in singapore and uh, and this company is also Acting very uh, uh, in a very massive scale in Diga, in uh, uh, in West Bengal, in Andhra Pradesh, in various states of the country, they are preparing fish feed. Goodrich companies there, IFB Agro is there. Amrit actually private limited, of course, it's not functioning. It's not functioning now. Then value and organic. These are the different companies apart from the fish studies department where there are a lot of scope for the job opportunities for the youngsters. I think I. Not take much time. Thank you very much. Thanks for to the participants um, uh, for uh, for having patience and uh, hearing me. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. We are really very much enriched with this uh, your webinar on this biotechnology in human welfare and the application of biotechnology on aquaculture. 
Now for the discussion part for the question and answer session, I will again uh, go to our uh, HOD ma'am, Dr. Koushik Chakraborty, and she will be continuing with the discussion. Part. Thank you, Thanks sir, also. for a very informative and nice presentation. I can see a few questions are waiting for you. Uh, yes, what is the importance of silicon in plankton? See, planktons, phytoplanktons are of different types, coccinodiscus, for example. It is a siliceous diatom. As I have told that the, that the empirical formula of phytoplankton is CH2 106 NH316 H3PO4, and there is also SiO3, that is silicon. Silicon made, makes the frustules, that means the covering of the diatoms. And here lies the importance of the silicon for this particular group of phytoplankton called the diatoms. Uh, yes, there is another question that is a yellow colored turtle recently in the village of Sundarban areas of the Kakdeep. Uh, I'm not very sure, but sometimes uh, the pigments are seen. For example, uh, as I've told you that this turtle, uh, uh, sometimes the green pigments are seen. Sometimes the green pigments are seen on that. Uh, and these green pigments are uh, nothing but the presence of some algae over there, which are, are, are not clean. But if you clean it with a the brush, then it gets detached. Some, I am not sure that whether because of the algal deposition. Uh, uh, if, if, the, if some of the specimen can be scrapped over, then, uh, then at least I can give you a confirmation or a confirmatory reply. Thank you, sir. Uh, I cannot find any more questions. Uh, well, thank you for your nice and informative presentation. Is there anybody want to ask any question? Is there any question for Dr. Mitra? If you have any question, please, you can put your question in the chat box. I, I don't think I, I do. Uh, yeah, yes, there is another question. Sir, is there any aquatic system that is without, uh, without any kind of planktons? Yes. Uh, if you go to the swimming pool of Taj Bengal, regularly they are doing the chlorination uh, to keep the uh, to keep to keep the swimming pool uh, uh, devoid of the plankton because often planktons may cause some harmful algal bloom called hub. So uh, of course these are seen in the five star and three star hotels. There are aquatic system where chlorination and the potassium permanganate is done to kill the plankton. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mitra, for your very nice and interesting session. Uh, now, I'd like to invite uh, Mrs. Moik Malamandul to handle the session three. Hello. Your microphone is off. Mrs. Mondol, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. It's not hearing. Welcome, Dr. Talapatro. I take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Shomendrana Talapatro, the last speaker of this session. Presently, Dr. Talapatro is an associate professor and PhD supervisor of bioscience, Sikom Skill University, Shantiniketon, Birbhum. 
he did his masters from ranchi university with geology and ecology specialization he completed his phd degree from ranchi university with collaboration of animal physiology bose institute kolkata after completion of phd he did post doctorate from indian institute of chemical biology kolkata his post doctoral training was in the field of genetic toxicology presently he is even a guest lecturer in the department of environmental science calcutta university and center for health care science and technology indian institute of engineering shippur howda his teaching experience was more than 15 years in the field of environmental science in calcutta university vidyasagar university robindra bharati university academic staff college maritime university his area of research interest are genetic biomonitoring and genotoxicity assessment software operation for qsar modeling image processing and bioinformatics dna damage scoring by software technology high volume sample for air pollution specially spm sampling and monitoring dna damage scoring by software technology he has published more than 60 scientific research paper in many prestigious peer reviewed journal he also very actively associated with many books and journals he is also an invited reviewer in international letters of natural sciences poland science press switzerland environmental science and pollution research springer press germany today his topic is use of computer tools in biological science so now i would like to request dr talapatro to deliver his speech over to thank, dr talapatro thank you mohikmala i am honored to charchandra college provides me this platform to share my research experiences especially i convey my thanks to professor onuradha ghosh teaching in charge professor shuparna sen iqc coordinator dr koushiki chakraborty hod department of geology and other faculties of department of geology charchandra college distinguished guests and my dear students i also thanks my earlier speakers dr vaibhav and dr abhijit mitra he is my elder brother definitely and i would like to share my research experience from wet lab to dry lab so i'll discuss this journey hope you will feel good so can you please in powerpoint dr koshiki yes you please share your screen please share your screen yeah it hasn't come yet go to share screen option it is not showing here please open your powerpoint slide first and then go to share screen option yeah it's there no yeah 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 now it has come okay so i would like to share on the topic use of computational tools in biological sciences like biological sciences which means the wet lab or in the field is it true so in this regard 
I would like to say that weight lab research, we previously did many experiments with daphnids, with fish, with mice, with monkey, and doctors basically for clinical trial, they use human. But in university com grant commission, UGC issued a notice regarding provision of animal use in universities. That is 5th August 2014. We cannot use at university level different animals for research for practical purposes. From 2014, I was curious that how I will proceed in the experiments which can give me toxicity data and also drug designing models to help new drug discovery. So what is dry lab? Use of informatics. The study in dry lab is known as in silico approach. So basically, this can be done in laptop or desktop, any computers. Like you have few softwares, you can proceed several research on the basis of in silico approach. So here I am showing three dimensional structure of compound. And here I'm showing three dimensional structure of protein. So from initial screening, like suppose there are several organic compounds. If we want to test individually, it takes several years. For that reason, if we screen many compounds, to know which one highly toxic, moderately toxic, less toxic, non-toxic. So it is uh, very, very useful for us to get a narrow range. So historical background that this in silicon word is Latin word and suggesting the mass utilization of silicon for computer chips. The treatment as in silico was first characterized in biological experiments, which was carried out entirely in a computer in 1989. Pedro Miramontes established in the workshop cellular automata theory and applications in Los Alamos, New Mexico. So benefits, because you know, in, in experimental study, in my subject, in my research area in genotoxicity and toxicity screening, it was uh, a, a, I, it took too much time consuming. So this in silico study is benefits faster rate of data generation within a minute, not month. No expenditure like weight lab, no animal harming. Few tools are commercial, but required to purchase once. These are online or offline tools. So in my research related, I got few softwares. These are basically free and few of them are academic, need some academic license. So these are QSR modeling, that is quantitative structure activity relationship modeling that Dr. Vaibhav earlier said, QSR modeling. Chemical structure representations. Like I showed there three dimensional structure. So from Corina software or in ChemDraw, you can draw and you can convert it to 2D to three dimensional. Then receptor ligand binding, autodoc, pyrex, post view, dog gold, etc. This is basically used for drug discovery, ademy, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretions, that is uh, basically used for pharmacokinetic study, bioavailability study, medicinal chemistry study, and image analysis, that is cell profiler, image J, etc. 
and so on. So I've given link below. Students can go to this link and check. There are several softwares, and they can use by trial error methods. And hope you will get too much interest in the new research of biotechnology. So we know that uh, initially, when I was in MSc, that biology and computers uh, two are different things, you know. So uh, from that time, so many uh, things in in our PhD time. Uh, the uh, when I uh, clicked the uh, Internet Explorer, it takes thirty minutes to forty minutes, and then it comes uh, web page. So uh, from that time, I was curious that the computational biology and bioinformatics, which are interdisciplinary field, because in abroad they started some informatics in biotechnology i was so curious and basically uh, it was uh, i thought that time very difficult science uh, we cannot approach easily so it develops and applies computational tools to analyze large collections of biological data such as genetic sequences cell populations protein samples to make new predictions or discover new biology the computational methods used in analytical methods, mathematical modeling, and simulation. So in computational biology, so whatever you will do in silico work through or by using computers, then it we say that computational biology. So first. I have given first because my subject is geology and biology. Uh, so I've given first biology, followed by chemistry, computer science, mathematics, statistics, numerical analysis, algorithmics, data management, image processing, QSAR, QSTR, evolution, biophysics, biochemistry, genetics, genomics, proteomics, molecular biology. So in this computational biology, like uh, people are from genetics, people are from molecular biology, people are from microbiology, people are from biology, people are from chemistry. Actually, uh, we need the cooperation of all subjects here. Otherwise, the data informatics cannot be completed. So computational tools used in biological research, there are several already I told, but I am concerning my research experiences in few of the experiments and the tools which I used earlier. So first one, image analysis tools for cell numbers and shape. QSAR, QSTR tools for biological activity and toxicity screening, admit tools for pharmacokinetic screening and drug designing. Can quantitative and qualitative cells and DNA damage score possible through image analysis tool? Yes, it is possible. You know, when I did experiment, in cell and genetic toxicology, that time, the cell analysis which I did under microscope, so I did gym sustained one, but uh, in uh, other people, they studied fluorescence dye. And basically, we saw just uh, cell number and the Cellular morphology, basically numerical nucleus morphology, right? But still, uh, some limitations was there, like time consuming for large scale screening, visual error by individual eye estimations, sometimes missing of cellular features, a subtle change undistinguishable by eye visually, proper expertise to recognize cellular features. An image analysis tool helps to minimize time, 
visual error, proper identification of cellular features, etc. Cell analysis with algorithm based software has been recommended by researchers Carpenter et al. 2006, Jones et al. 2009, Bray et al. 2015, and in 2016, I studied with this tool. So, according to Carpenter et al. 2006, she is from MIT, USA, and her team developed the image analysis software that is cell profiler, which can capable of handling 100 numbers of cells or images. Interestingly, this tool can estimate total numbers and shape of the cells, cytoplasm, nucleus, in case of each cell. When I did experiments, I, I am showing you my wet lab experiments followed by dry lab experiment. So basic steps, imagine that is you have slides, maybe fluorescent dye stained or uh, gymsa stained, so or less man stains. So you just take photograph through CC camera attached with microscope. Then this image directly you put in the software or tool. Then whatever data you will get, you just visualize and analyze. So when I did cellular deformities in peripheral erythrocytes of fish, uh, that uh, normal erythrocytes is first one A and B is micronucleated erythrocytes and the C is binucleated erythrocytes. This was published in Food and Chemical Toxicology in 2010, but I am telling you the uh, cell scoring with cell deformities too much tedious work, 1,000 cells per fish. And I used a five set of experiments. Right side, you can see here. Right side, you can see here. These are the experimental setup controls, experimental one, two, and positive controls. So, and in between vehicle control. So, for individual cell, sorry, in individual slide, 1,000 cell scoring was, it was taken, you know, one month per 1,000 cells with cell deformities. But I tried to get cell shape, uh, you know, uh, being a zoology uh, student, that uh, stage micrometer, ocular micrometer can measure. But I am telling it is a tedious job five set of experiments, each set of experiments is 10 number of fish. So per fish, 2000 cell scoring. So total cell scoring is five sets means 50,000 cell scoring. So now this worked, I, I got, I have many images. So these images were taken in, 2016, I got this software, and basically, this is known as CP or cell profiler software. And the input interface, I tried a lot because it is new for me. And directly, I contacted to uh, Professor Carpenter in MIT through email that uh, you, you did it in fluorescent dye uh, cell scoring or cell shape determination and cellular features determination. But I am doing in gym sustain dye, whether I'm in the right direction or not, please let me know. They helped a lot. They suggested, OK, you, uh, you take a pipeline in our uh, software and you try it definitely will get success. So uh, by their help, my effort, I studied and by trial and method, and I got the CP results. Like in control and experimental, I got the area. But interestingly, you see that cells separately, cytoplasm separately, nuclei separately. 
which could not be possible in earlier when I used long time under microscope. In another experiment that, <coughs> sorry, in another experiment like comets, you know, when single strand break in DNA occurs, then this comet form. It is known as single cell gel electrophoresis. So 2004, I studied in fish blood cell that is RBC by using benzene that they damage DNA and I got image and I tried here to obtain the measurement of this comet because in experiments see it on 1986 in US initially they studied this DNA damage in single cell gel electrophoresis and basically comet means there is a small head there is a small head and long tail and the tail determines the degree of DNA damage or single strand breaks. So again I am telling this is fluorescent uh, ethidium bromide I used that time under fluorescence microscope individual measurement of comet very very tedious job. So directly with the cell profiler software I got the data on comet, comet head, and comet tail. And this is also published in 2016. Now, besides image analysis, I got too much interest in this dry lab or in silico work. And I developed myself through this QSR modeling research and pharmacokinetics research, molecular docking research. So here I questioned that first screening by using software can useful. Yes, it is useful. So study was based on quantitative structure activity relationship. Like I am giving an example, if you want to screen 50 toxic compounds, suppose here, uh, uh, first let me brief that I here take cypermethrin that is synthetic pyrethroid and as a directin that it is found in neem leaf there are several flavonoids several polyphenolic acids sterols curcumins tannins so like 50 phyto compounds or 50 synthetic compounds if you want to compare that whether plant products is toxic or synthetic product is toxic how much toxic so for that experiment, I found that 50, here I didn't give only one, I have given the data of synthetic compound and natural compounds comparison I have sold. So here that initially in weight lab, I studied uh, one year, basically three replica and with daphnium, uh, serodaphnia dubia species, toxicity testing, initially acclimatization process. So terrible experiments in the things. But here, the median lethal concentration, LC50 prediction, milligram per liter, I got 50 compounds within one hour. So it is very, very interesting for toxicity prediction. And I use test software, toxicity estimation software tool developed by United States Environment Protection Agency in 2012. Another experiment, 
I said earlier that adimi, that is synthetic and natural compounds to know pharmacokinetic drug likeness, medicinal chemistry, so many others parameters. The prediction was done by using Swiss Ademi online tool developed by Dan et al. 2017. This is Swiss software and online software basically. The interface is this and in this interface just for unknown compound you know the structure you can draw here or you know the compound so directly you can go to pubchem that is chemical database from that database you just take smiles it is written smiles simplified molecular identification line entry system that is carbon string and just you incorporate here i think uh, 20 compounds you, you can easily input here and then click run you will get within 15 to 20 minutes after simulation they will give these so many parameters results one of my study in 2019 uh, one of my phd student studies bhaskar kormukas so uh, basically uh, here we we have seen that the uh, anona reticulata leaf the camphorol and chlorogenic acid, these are flavonoids, basically known in the methacine medicine, which is anti-inflammatory drug, but synthetic drug. Uh, how compared uh, this can uh, use as natural products for drug design? Because in the methacine, any synthetic compounds that earlier speaker has said that toxic compounds, uh, any drug. So for that reason, I have tried to uh, determine the natural products, flavonoids from anona reticulata leaf extract. Already it is there because GCMS analysis is already done. And you can you can get lit in literature several phyto compounds, particular leaves, stems, fruits, leaves, roots, anywhere. So from there, I have taken the data of uh, and selected from literature that which compounds are uh, available as phyto compounds in particular uh, extract and it more or less indomethacin and camphorol indomethacin and camphorol more or less showed similar results now another study that is i said in molecular docking and interactions one of very important plants found in ditches in any in nearby wetlands, which is known as in Bengali Kulekhara, and this is scientific name is Hygrophila spinosa. Basically, these plant extract use aqueous extract used for the prevention of anemia. But again, plant leaves or plant parts. It is not always free from toxins. It's like Indrajit, Putna, so many other researchers have studied that some toxins are present also as secondary metabolites or phytocompounds in leaves, in plant parts, which is known as allelochemicals. So, uh, my question is that when we are taking as extract directly their possibility so many phyto compounds we are ingesting so from that curiosity basically this three-dimensional protein structure is here i'm showing it is oxyhemoglobin and we published in 2016 that this beta carotene is a suitable allosteric effect so in near future, like anybody wants to make drug, so directly they can extract particular phyto compound, which is potent lead compound. And the from that lead compound is a natural product. And initially we studied the toxicity, also pharmacokinetics, so in software. So 
after that these can go to directly weight lab so benefit is that from higher range to lower range we can get the data which finally can be used for weight lab analysis so in conclusion computational prediction modeling and simulation can be helpful faster screening can possible for cellular morphology and numbers prior to experimental study screening helps to identify large number of toxic or genotoxic or mutagenic compounds for biota like daphnis fish rats and salmonella strains faster screening of lead molecule for new drug design last but not the least this is for students career opportunities i got uh, these two indian companies basically institutes they provide one year internship program in computational biology and bioinformatics because one year from uh, very recently they want to start 5th october 2020 to 30th september 2021 basically they provide different software operations and might be they can provide placement also the students can uh, uh, contact another eminent bioscience mahalakshmi nagar indore madhya pradesh provide research oriented projects or internship dissertation for the partial fulfillment of bsc msc btech mphil mtech phd this organization trains the candidates for one month before starting the project with various softwares and tools and databases on bioinformatics aspects of life science research and relevance to industry few job opportunities as the position is like bioinformatics analyst it is uh, you have to know the bioinformatics and basically uh, msc degree should be eligible criteria and biostatistics computer science equivalent in life science discipline and better you uh, learn uh, some other places like perl or python programming language then it is too much suitable then proteomics bioinformatics data analyst aragon technologies private limited pune maharashtra hmm. project manager discovery biology since in india understanding drug discovery value chain in biotech and pharma industry masters in life science with background in biotechnology biology pharma related discipline data scientist here also need some uh, learn uh, r language or python language then uh, in pharma healthcare domain they also hire people in bangalore uh, karnataka this company exists now discovery program manager for amedabad in amedabad gujarat the successful candidate will be responsible for cultivating relationship managing accounts and securing opportunities for selling drug discovery stand alone and integrated services in synthetic chemistry heat finding uh, said told dr by uh, hope that heat finding is the uh, ultimate in drug design so if you know the heat finding study you can directly approach to the particular organization machine learning research scientists like image processing i showed that it is based on machine learning algorithm and senior clinical data manager also in maharashtra pune that cytel statistical software and services they also provide jobs acknowledgements professor sinushita swarnakar head cancer biology and inflammatory disorder division csr icb dr nugul chandra maiti senior scientist structural biology division csr icb dr somu ganguli research assistant professor at vanderbilt university nashville tennessee and dr uttam pal sinp science student of nuclear physics kolkata uh, with their help i learned these things and um, joint papers also there and all my phd scholars under me they are always inspiring me sir you do this way sir you can do it so thank you them bani mondol kia bhattacharya bhaskar karmakar anup kumar manna and so many chakraborty dr subroto re he is an md in pharmacology so i 
convey my thanks to them. And finally, thank you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your very impressive and informative presentation. Very informative presentation. It was a very informative presentation and hope it will open a new avenue for our students in the field of occupation. Now I am requesting Dr. Koushiki Chakraborty for highlighting some questions in the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Talapatru, for your very uh, informative and informative session. Uh, now the lecture is open for discussion. Participants, if you have any questions, please write it in the chat box. Till now, I cannot see any question. Dear participants, if you have any questions, you can directly ask. You can write it in the chat box. May I request Dr. Talapatra to do stop sharing? OK. I cannot see any questions. OK, so I think uh, there is no questions. OK, it's all right. Thank you then. Uh, thank you for your nice lecture, Dr. Talapatra. Thank you. Dr. Uh, now, Dr. yeah, welcome. Now I would, li I would like to invite our honorable IQSC coordinator, Dr. Shuparna Shane, to conclude the session, please. Dr. Shuparna Shane, over to Dr. Shane. Thank you once again, professors, uh, Dr. Dixit, Dr. Abhijit Mitro, and Dr. Talapatro for your extremely interesting uh, and uh, enlightening lectures, <clears throat> which have definitely left all the students, all the scholars, and everyone who listened and participated a lot wiser. We have also been enlightened. Uh, Dr. Vaibhav Dixit spoke at length on drug toxicity and the prevention of drug toxicity, which is very much pertinent nowadays. Uh, as we hear of a number of cases where uh, drug toxicity uh, plays an important part in the mortality of patients in this uh, ongoing COVID environment. Uh, so we learned from it also. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Obhijit Mitro also spoke on how biotechnology is being applied in uh, aquaculture. And he also told us uh, at length on how to restore the food chain of biodiversity in the Sundarban areas, and also how to create uh, fish uh, culture, how to develop the fish <clears throat> as a semi PC culture. Uh, and he also uh, stressed on the importance of restoration in biodiversity and how um, Professor Talapatsu told us and how wet and dry labs can also do miracles in the field of biotechnology research. Uh, we are all very extremely grateful for the wonderful talks that we uh, have listened to. And I'm sure everyone has benefited, especially the scholars, the students, the people who have the technical knowledge of these things, they have definitely benefited more. But we, the ordinary speakers, have also learned a lot. Uh, with this, uh, I once again thank you. I would uh, officially or formally declare the webinar closed and request Dr. Uh, Koushiki Chakraborty to give a vote of thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
চুপ কর চুপ কর চুপ কর একদম চুপ 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 এখন আসো না আসো না নিন <laughs> চারুচন্দ্র কলেজ professor dr shibranjan chatterjee for giving us permission to organize series of webinars and web lectures i heartily convey my gratitude to honorable teacher in charge and chief patron of this webinar professor onuradha ghosh and honorable coordinator iqsc and chief advisor of this webinar dr suparna shen for their relentless cooperation support and motivation Words are insufficient to express my heartfelt thanks to our honorable speakers, Dr. Dekshit, Dr. Mitra, and Dr. Talapatro for their extremely valuable and worthy lectures. I would like to convey thanks to all the participants for being with us to make a successful webinar. I would also like to convey thanks to all the colleagues of the Department of Zoology Mrs. Kanti Sri Goshyami, Mrs. Mohikmala Mondal, Dr. Obhinabha Mukherjee and Mrs. Pallavi Datta and Moomita Bishesh and Mrs. Paramita Chatterjee from Department of Computer Science for their active participation and constant cooperation. Last but not least, I must have to convey thanks to all our beloved students of Department of Zoology not only the current students but also ex students for their enthusiasm and cooperation thanks to all non teaching staff of the department of zoology for their cooperation prior to close the session i just would like to convey the take home message of the webinar for the students who have joined this webinar from different parts of india and abroad i just want to add one line that after attainment of your degree don't waste prolonged period to look for a job rather you please enhance your skills by using different tools in biotechnology and bioinformatics after that you can develop your own job that means you can become your own boss so welcome to self employment amid this new normal lifestyle and after pandemic situation as well so keep your depressions and frustrations at bay and welcome to self employment thank you thank you for being with us thank you for your patience uh, stay healthy stay safe fine okay good night end of the session pranam <clears throat>